welcome uh, Dr. Mustafa Mukhtar, who is a general practitioner who works in Wolverhampton. Uh, he is also a, a lecturer at Aston University, and he's he's well practiced and versed in, in the art of telemedicine. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides now, and I will very like we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Mustafa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ahmed. Thanks, Abdul Azim, and um, all the team in the webinar. I don't describe myself as an expert in telemedicine, but the reality that we are in, especially in the UK, um, in primary care, we've been actually thrown into this. And um, we've, we've done a lot of um, remote consulting and use of um, telemedicine over the last um, few months. So, what I'm going to talk about is briefly about the telemedicine in primary care and I will probably touch on what we do here uh, what's happening globally and what could be the prospect in um, in Sudan so um, can you see my slides yes we can see them well okay so what is telemedicine in short in short it's healing at a, at a distance and so it it goes with the care that you provide. The wider term um, that has always been used is telehealth, which includes, um, yes, providing the care to the patient, but also communication between professionals and the educational aspect and the public awareness. So all of these four would constitute telehealth. However, um, as the WHO actually acknowledged, both terms are now being used interchangeably. So. Um, so, the, so telemedicine could be used to mean um, managing patients at a distance using technology and um, communication between professionals as well as the educational aspect. So this definition, I'm not going to read this definition because it's there at the WHO website. And it talks about, as we said, distance is a crucial factor and also um, there is a use of information and communication technology for um, exchange of valid information. And this could be used for diagnosis, treatment, research, and education as well. So the purpose, um, and that's in general, I'm sure some of you might be touching in depth um, about this. The, the use of technology, as we said, ge geographical barriers, and there's a clinical support uh, element as well. Now, there are two basic types of telemedicine, as some of you might know. So it, according to the timing of the sharing of the information, it could be synchronous where, like what we are doing now. So, so there is a, a direct communication through use of technology, but it could also be asynchronous. For example, um, we do sometimes do email consultations. So some, some patients might send an email and they expect a reply back within a few days or um, there are services where you can get an advice from you guys in secondary and in tertiary care and that might take a few days as well you can also divide them by uh, the type of interaction the individuals that are interacting so it could be professional professional telemedicine educational advice um, liaison improvement of the service but it could also be professional to patient. And that is probably what has been more enhanced recently, as well as the professional to professional telemedicine as well. Right, now this is a diagram that would actually show, it's, it's from the um, Indian Space Research. It shows how integration can happen between um, different um, entities of the healthcare using the technology. Now, when we talk about asynchronous uh, telemedicine, that's what I have just expl um, explained. So um, information could be stored and then you will get a communication back probably in a later time rather than immediate one. And the synchronous is the immediate type of communication. Now, barriers to telemedicine in developing countries. Um, there are few papers which were written to try and look at what are the challenges of use of telemedicine. I was surprised to know that only 0.1% of the 
of the capacity of use of telemedicine is actually being used on the ground in um, developing countries. Ironically, developing countries might be in more need of telemedicine because there is a shortage of access to healthcare in different remote areas. And also telemedicine, as we might see, it does save money. So it is rewarding as well. But unfortunately, there are difficulties in such countries, including, of course, Sudan. Also, when we look at the group who benefit from, tele, uh, from telemedicine, they found that women, children, all people, and people who have disability, these are the groups who struggle with the access in general to healthcare, but they also struggle with the use of telemedicine. So the more telemedicine we use, we find that actually this group of people are less likely to get engaged for, for, for different various reasons. So that might bring us to, if you know this gentleman, Julian Tudor Hart, who spoke about the inverse care law. Um, this is his, his, his a GP who has been working in the, the principle and the philosophy of providing a global or a, um, a universal health care. And he said this, this inverse care law, which indicates that people who are in more need for health care are the ones who are likely to have difficulty with the access. So if you think of it, when you implement any type of access, let's say using telemedicine, if you are not careful and you're not considering these people who struggle with the access, you will find yourself, you are selecting those who have internet connection, those who are generally younger, those who are generally um, able to use these technologies. And these are, by and large, tend to be the people who are less in need of the healthcare service itself. And those who are more deprived, the older, the, young, the, the children, the disabled, these are less likely to have access to these technology things. So in, so in the same way, telemedicine can provide access to the disadvantaged group, it can actually increase the gap if we are not careful when we implement them, they can increase the gap um, of them accessing the healthcare. Right, now in primary care, what, what's happening in primary care? So in the UK, before COVID, as GPs, we used to do, most of us used to do partial telephone triage, which means some people might get booked in face to face, and some people might get a telephone call from a nurse practitioner or from a GP, and then they will be seen face to face. So that's partial telephone triage. And some of us used to do video consulting. It wasn't as widespread as is happening now um, during the COVID era. And email advisory referrals as well, as I mentioned earlier. Teledermatology um, is actually one of the biggest um, secondary care, well, one of the biggest specialist um, specialties that are, that have been invested on in primary care. So we used to have many teledermatology um, clinics where the patient would go to the clinic, they wouldn't see the dermatologist, but they would see probably maybe a nurse who would take photographs of their lesions, take some history, and then this would be sent to the specialist. The specialist might be somewhere in London, in Scotland, and they will respond back by directly contacting the patient or by sending an advice back to where the teledermatology clinic is. And it has been, it has been working. Now, after COVID, NHS England, and NHS England is the body that is commissioned to provide the day-to-day -day as well as managing the budget of the NHS in England. So they did advise us to do a full triage system during COVID-19. So everybody before seeing a GP, they should have some form of triage. And we still, we are still doing it. Gradually, things might change. Some GPs actually 
they said, you know what, it really works very well. So let's just carry on with the total triage system. But it also allowed more horizontal collaboration. So practices have been working together with each other. And the video consulting has been more and more widespread. At least I, I do at least one or two video consultations every day in primary care. So this, for example, this is one of the systems that we use for video consulting at QRX, where you've got these options here. If you click on this and it does populate, uh, populate the patient's records and send a link to the patient's smartphone, when they follow that link and they allow their camera to be used, then you can see them and, in, and they can see you and you can interact with them. They can sh show you pictures of lesions. You can see a child, how they are breathing um, while you are um, talking to their parent. You also have the option of sending a text message to the patient and allowing them to send a text back with an attachment. That is very good if you want a picture for skin rash or something like this. So this is, this is probably the system that is used by majority of the GPs in the UK at the moment. Now, so um, video consulting comes with some caveat. So we noticed that in primary care, obviously there is less interaction. There is a limited um, examination. There is examination, but can be limited. It's not acceptable by all patients. That is true in Sudan. It's also true for us as well. Some people would still want to see you face to face. And some doctors do not feel comfortable making decisions um, over remote consulting and they would say, well, I would rather see the patients. Now that can be, could be a little bit of um, a difficult thing for them to adapt with the new reality, but there are not many. Majority of the doctors are actually um, using remote consulting at the moment. So the benefits that you can get actually in the other side is you, it can, so that's the benefit of video consulting as opposed to telephone consultation. So more reassuring to the patient, the patient knows that you've seen them and um, it can actually tell you how does the patient look like? Are they very sick? Are they breathless? Do they look in pain? And um, you can also, also see some signs as well and you can demonstrate something to the patient. You could, you could show them, for example, how to check their pulse, the pulse for the loved one and things, and things like that. Now, um, patients are able to understand easier. You will be using some um, visual clues, some paralinguistics as well. Now, what is happening in Sudan? There are opportunities because primary care in Sudan is evolving. People now start to know about it. And, um, and appreciate the role it plays. Telemedicine is rewarding because if a clinician is staying at home, they are self-isolating, they can still provide care from their own home. And there are some voluntary initiatives inside and outside Sudan that can help provide uh, telemedicine clinics and things like that. So there is, for example, there's an initiative by the family medicine physicians in Sudan now, and what they're doing is they have got a list of patients who have COVID-19, but staying at home. And what they do is proactively, they do give them a call um, at least once a week to make sure that they are well in themselves, they didn't develop any complications that would need to go to the hospital, they provide mental health support um, at home, they answer their questions. So, so it's really helpful. And I, I hear that at the moment, they have just over 2000 patients in their list that they are managing um, in their home. There is no much integration with secondary and tertiary care, unfortunately, although these family physicians in Sudan are keeping good number of patients outside hospital. Now this, way, this actually reminded me of what is called forward triage. And forward triage is, um, it's a new term that only appeared in this COVID era. 
And this article, which is written and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in March, looked at how telemedicine in the United States has been transformed as a result of COVID-19. And it looked at all the areas of healthcare, starting from community paramedicine, going through ED all the way to EITU. And it's, it's, it's remarkable because this, this, this has only been published three months ago, and you can see it has only been cited, it has already been cited 184 times. So it can tell you how much people are interested in telemedicine. Now, the reason I brought this in is because they mentioned the forward triage where an automated system, um, like a, a software uh, through a smartphone uh, would, would triage the patient and the patient can use it. And those who are, who are high risk will be streamed to um, a nurse who would ring that patient and give them an advice. Um, it also, it, it looked at not waiting for the patient to come to you, but triaging patient in the home before they actually come to the service. And that's exactly what is happening now in Sudan. So sorting patients before they arrived at the emergency point of service, whether that is in primary care or in secondary care. Now innovations, I, I remember actually some, um, some of the care homes here in the UK, they are using Messenger. So they created a, an account, a personal account on Messenger to allow families to communicate with their loved ones in the care home. And it's, it's, really, it's really good because that is simple, that's available to anybody. You don't have to um, disclose your phone number, like in using WhatsApp, for example, and it is being used. So, 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 so people can see their, um, their grandparents, their grand um, or, or their parents in the care home. So this could be used. I think it could be used in Sudan, although not everybody obviously uses Messenger, but it is something that is available to everybody and it could be used for video consulting because I am aware that not all the video consulting platforms are actually available um, in Sudan. We may have some community units. So those, the younger who, who can use technology and have access to internet, they can create small units in the community where they can have virtual clinics with doctors somewhere else. So that can be really useful in remote areas. Um, so this is an idea that could also be implemented um, in Sudan. Now, finally, before I go, so horizontal integration, that is a concept which has been enhanced during this COVID era. Horizontal integration is when primary care centers work together. We know that not all primary care centers have got the technology to use um, telemedicine, but by working together, you can actually triage patients. So, those, so these centers would see patients face to face, these centers would see the high risk patients, and these centers are for telemedicine. Vertical integration is when we in primary care work with you guys in secondary care. Community to community integration is like what I mentioned earlier, having units from the community where people can access the technology to, um, to communicate with the professionals. And thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Mustafa. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Um, I think really uh, due to the COVID crisis, we've all been pushed into using telemedicine. So I think that's really useful to get your experiences. Um, I was wondering, does anybody from the panel have any uh, questions or comments that they'd like to ask at this stage? Right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. I'm Mohammed Badri from Sudan. Yes, I would like to ask, uh, thank you Mustafa very much for this uh, very interesting talk about uh, the problem of the integration between the primary and secondary care. Uh, I mean, I mean, how's going to sort that out? I mean, for example, in Sudan, it will be very difficult for us because the primary health care is not well demarcated in the catchment areas. And still there's a problem with connecting the primary health care to secondary care. 
So from your experience, how, how, how do you think that we can sort out or we can overcome this problem? Yeah, I think, yes, I agree with you. It's, it's probably difficult, but not impossible. I think it can be because it's in the interest of both primary and secondary care. Secondary care would like to liaise with primary care so that they would reduce, reduce the pressure that they are facing um, among themselves. What I guess is, I don't think the issue of the catchment area could be a huge barrier to this because um, you can always, the hospitals can always make links with certain healthcare centers. Now, I know that some healthcare centers have got a certain list of patients in them, with them. This list of patients, they know who have got, for example, diabetes, who have cardiac disease, who have asthma. So I think if, the, if each hospital is, has been, um, is, is being affiliated or each primary care, three or four primary care centers being affiliated to a certain hospital to provide two things. First of all, um, quick advice. So if the, if the family physician wanted an advice, for example, um, then they can be um, contacted um, rather than asking the patients to go through the difficult access route to the secondary care. The second thing is admission as well. I know some of the family physicians, when they contact patients at home, for example, they know that this patient has got um, a certain condition or certain complication that requires going to the hospital. So asking the patient to find a way of getting there, I think might be a little bit tricky. So for the hospital, this is somebody who already triaged it. Why can't the hospital have access to uh, or allow the family physicians to directly admit patient um, to these wars. So I think it's all about collaboration and talking together. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Junejo. Would you like Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, br br brilliant talk, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, very impressed. I think your uh, your overview is um, really, really impressive. I think it's a very, very complex uh, field as we are learning even in the so-called first world around the difficulties of uh, communicating, having um, uh, protection for uh, clinically relevant and important data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the, the limitations that you highlight very well are related to the geography and access to technology. And I think uh, for places like Sudan, where perhaps the geography and the general sort of uh, uh, availability of resource in, in society limits the uh, ability of people to reach where they need to reach for treatment, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to try and use telehealth and telemedicine to try and fix some of the fixable problems. I mean, I can give you an example of stroke medicine, which in the UK certainly has been practicing telemedicine for a long time and delivering um, early thrombolysis for stroke patients. I mean, that's a fantastic example. I think one of the pitfalls that I think you, you probably are more aware of from primary care point of view that I, I wanted to highlight as part of this comment was the fact that even in, in the UK, our difficulty has been having multiple sim systems to try and integrate them. If in the Sudanese con context, if the government or Department of Health or any organization that wishes to take a lead and maybe ensure that there is a single system that is applicable and everybody can link into it, it probably will take away a lot of the teething problems and the uh, operational issues that we face in um, in the UK. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Said, would you like to come? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone, good morning everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, great talk. I really enjoyed the new terminology that you've put into my head, vertical and horizontal communication. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, Especially in our environment in the UK, you can imagine the uh, managers who are in charge of us will see this as an opportunity of efficiency and changing tariffs that we all are to abide to regarding time of consultation, 
pressure on us in primary care as you are 10 minute consultations and we are a similar 10 minute 15 minute consultations do you see any pitfalls where people will ask you to work harder because i'm finding it's actually it takes me longer when i do any video consultation because yeah. i'm not used to it right now yes and, yeah. but the way i'm paid and the way you're paid and how I, the primary care works in secondary care in the uk that needs to catch up because we need to get the fundamentals right because yeah. covid has, as you say speeded everything up but our payment systems are still behind mm -hmm. like absolutely comment. yeah yeah absolutely i mean this is really interesting because what we are doing actually in primary care now is not telephone triage we are doing telephone consultation mm -hmm. we are sorting out the patient's problem we are not we're not triaging them and and you sometimes find yourself the video telephone consultation is taking longer than the face to face consultation because you want to be safer so you would take more detailed history and also you may ask the patient to send the picture back and then you call them back and then the picture didn't arrive and then that one is not clear so it does actually take a, a longer time in the flip side though patients accessing primary care has been less. People have been slightly wary of coming into um, hospital or contacting the, the system. That's why we are seeing less actually attendance into this. And I think that balance things out. So, uh, so we're not overly busy, but the question would be if we wanted to continue after COVID, after people actually want to go back to the usual access and the usual number of requests for appointment, and we wanted to continue with this, I think we would be overwhelmed and we have to look at different models to, um, to tackle that one. Thank you. Um, I had a question um, regarding, mainly regarding technology, because one of the problems I faced is using a, sort of a manual telephone and speaking to the patient and trying to write or to, to, to type it's quite difficult. Do you have any sort of advice regarding the appropriate technology and what we should try to to get in to help make that easier? I, I personally use the speaker in my phone and I type as I as I um, speak to uh, my patients. I know if it is a if you are using your mobile phone, I don't know maybe headphones or something like this, um, or any other um, gadget to allow you to have um, your hands free. Um, Probably the trick one is the video consulting where you wouldn't be able to, you actually want to focus on the patient. You don't want to be distracted from them and, and, and appear to be typing or looking somewhere else. Um, yeah, but I think, I think it's manageable in terms of the, of the telephone. You, you could use obviously the speaker or, or headphones, I, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, we, some, we use, um, uh, pick, we ask patients following pacemaker device procedures uh, to send photos of their wound um, to our clinic uh, six weeks afterwards. Uh, we find that very useful actually to, to, to do that. One of the problems we've had though is regarding sort of documenting these things. Do you have any advice about how we can uh, document uh, particularly pictures and video consultations? So the system, the AQRX system that we're using in primary care, when the patient sends the picture back, you have the option of saving it, saving them directly into the patient's records. So that's very handy. Um, you could do that. Um, so if you have that facility, I guess um, it is possible. I don't know about whether in the hospital system you can actually download the picture and attach it um, there. But I guess um, it seems like technology nowadays can do everything in terms of um, um, these things. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure about the hospital system, but in primary care, it, you just click on it and you download it and it goes into the patient's records. Okay, great. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments? Ahmed, if you don't mind, thank you. I would like just to thank uh, Dr. Mustafa for this fantastic talk and I'm really sorry I was having just some uh, technical uh, problem and I was concentrated merely how to fix it and I didn't listen to be honest to your all talk but my point here what do you think about discussing DNR with elderly uh, patients who is in reality is really difficult to discuss in the clinic 
So, yeah. what do you think about this? Uh, do you have any system in place, to, for example, to go and visit them at home or to, for example, to speak to the next of kin to discuss on behalf or how do you deal that in the community? Yeah, you've just mentioned one of the tricky things that we've been um, always talking about and we couldn't find the panacea. It's very difficult. And um, uh, we, we try to avoid face-to-face -face contact, even in the discussions at the end of life care. Thankfully, people who are in care home and in nursing home, the nurses have now done the lots of um, trainings that these nurses have gone through. And as a result of COVID-19, to be able to actually do things that we normally use to go physically and do them so they can explain to the patients about DNA, CPR, explain the palliative care. They can actually now verify death as well. Um, it's trickier for patients in their own home. So we try to, to do as much as we can. We use the video consulting um, with sometimes with the relatives, sometimes with the patients um, themselves. And this, the whole system is recognizing this. In the past, we used to be able to um, to do a death certificate only if we if we had seen the patient in within the last 14 days uh, before the, before they passed away. Now that has been relaxed. So if you only saw them through a video consulting within a month of them passing away, that is considered as a contact with the patient and that you recognize the patient so you can issue it. So there the are different ways around it, but I don't think we came to a panacea and it's always about balancing the risk and, and, and the benefit. But I agree with you, it is a tricky one. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I have one question? Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, about the COVID triaging, I mean, in Sudan, they have started this process, but it's still very difficult to implement it widely because the problem is when you call the patient or the patient calls a call center or have a contact with a doctor, I mean, the scoring system, I mean, the main purpose of the COVID triaging in secondary care is that to identify patients who are, whether they are low risk or intermediate risk or high risk, and to tell them where to go about. I mean, for example, point A or B or C, the green or the red or the, or the, or the, or the, or the, or the orange. So how, how do you do it in, in, in the primary health care? I think you're going to still get a lot of information over the phone or the video from the patient that would answer the question of, does this patient need to go or can they stay safely at home? That is what we are doing here in the UK. And I understand that's what they're doing in Sudan as well. It's difficult, yes, to, to do the fully, you know, the scoring system um, um, by the, um, in Sudan, by the authorities in Sudan. Um, but at least you've got the, 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 um, the clinical judgment of how, how the breathing of the patient is. You can, you can know the risk factor. You know how old they are. You know the situation at home. Do they live? With, with, with somebody who have access to a car and there is a hospital nearby, how educated the patients around them. So I think obviously you would use your clinical judgment, but I think you can still get um, a lot of information by just talking to the patient over the phone. The problem I think is that there is no unified um, way, there's no unified system for the patient. So in the UK, everybody knows there is one, one, one. That is not the case in Sudan. There are a number of initiatives, um, yes. Family medicine physician, they have got a phone number, yes. Not everybody in Sudan is aware of it. And there's a phone number for people who suspected COVID-221, um, of course, but that is only for COVID. So what about those who are not sure? What about those who have other problems during the COVID? So I think because there is no one, there is no single point of care system, that is where the uh, confusion um, comes from. Hopefully that would be re uh, rectified and people would be able to liaise with each other. Thank you. Professor Junejo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, a question and a, and a comment, please. Uh, the question uh, essentially is uh, to both Dr. Badri and to Dr. Ibrahim around um, 
They mentioned scoring system. Could you clarify what scoring system are you, you are using or referring to? Um, uh, and the comment, uh, because there are many, and, and some of them relate to the commonly used early warning scoring system and so on and so forth. And, and depending on who the professional is, whether it is video conferencing, whether it is a nurse at the bedside or a family member and so on and so forth. So which, which particular scoring system are you referring to? Now, the comment I have is in relation to similar systems being used in uh, other Southeast Asian or, or, or um, West Asian countries where people are using uh, a very crude tool such as uh, a respiratory rate, uh, temperature, and uh, oxygen saturation measured by um, a, a small SATS monitor, uh, which is commercially available in the, in, in the, in the market for people to pick up. Uh, and using those three discriminators as an indicator towards the severity of suspected COVID or a suspected respiratory illness um, by telephone triage and, and, and making the appropriate referrals and so on and so forth. So could, could I have clarity and would you consider using something like a SATS monitor and is it feasible to use that in, in Sudan? Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if you might, so the Federal Ministry of Health in Sudan, they have got a scoring system where they look at different criteria. The scoring system is not to tell how likely somebody has got COVID or not, but it tells how severe, um, how severely ill they are. So, so it looks at the risk factors or, or how severe they, they might be should they have COVID. So it looks like whether they have a risk factor or not. Um, are they diabetic? Are they um, over, over the age like elderly? Um, do they have any other comorbidity? But it also looks at other parameters like the respiratory rate, like the heart rate and the oxygen saturation. They still have, um, I think like a two points for whether they have been in contact with somebody with COVID or not, which I think that should change now um, as the phase that they are, they are now in. So, and then it depends on how high the scoring is. Protocol changes initially, it was, if it was six or above, then the patient will be contacted uh, or, um, so the, um, so an ambulance will go out, visit them at home, take a swab, take them to the hospital if they need it. So, so this is, this is, this is how, how it works. Yes, there is oxygen saturation, there is respiratory rate. There are information in the scoring system that are difficult to get over the phone. Um, but then that could be replaced by your clinical ju judgment. Is the, is the patient talking um, without interruption? Do they have to take their breath to, to, to say the second word and, and things like that. In terms of the oxygen saturation, there was a problem um, um, with it. It wasn't widely used before COVID in Sudan, even in primary care. And that surprised me because it's a simple gadget that any family physician could have. But they started to realize it and they are using it. The problem is the people, lay people, have actually started using it as well. And there's a problem of the supply. It's very expensive to get a pulse oximeter in Sudan now uh, because everybody is buying it and keeping it at home um, uh, just, just for the use of it. So I think, yeah, they should be, uh, there, is, there is an issue um, of supply, but they started to realize how important to have an oxygen sat monitor in, in a primary care center. Thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. Um, we have got one question from the uh, audience that uh, is an important question. Uh, I'll raise it now, but some of the, we may have some further answers for this question later on in the talk. So the question is regarding physical examination of patients, particularly with, 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 te with telephone consultations. Um, the question is regarding what, how we do that and is, is how can we do the examination? Any, any uh, advice regarding that? Uh, yeah, so um, I remember I was doing a lecture to the family medicine registrars in Sudan virtually and what I used to emphasize on is don't think there is no physical examination on a telephone. Um, there is a limited female physical examination, but there is physical examination. You can tell so how the patient looks like if he's a video consultant, how they talk, are they confused or not, are they breathless or not. Um, so 
a, a lot of information. You can get a third party information to tell you. Because remember, over, over the phone, you don't want to diagnose whether they have an enlarged spleen or not. You want to know whether they are very sick and they need to come or they can be managed at home and, and then be followed up um, further. So this is, this, is, this is a part, but there is examination, but it's a limited form of examination. And obviously video consulting would give you even, um, even more examination. Um, third party information can be helpful as well. If someone else will tell you how this patient looks like, whether they are sick, whether they are unwell. I mean, obviously other people may um, feed into this, but th that's my, my, my view of it. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. You've been fantastic and thank you for your patience. We really appreciate it for you if you could uh, stay with us for the next uh, session.